It is now time for question period. And I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to start this morning then to a question for the Minister of Education. Last week, the Ministry of Education quietly issued instructions for school boards, ordering them to plan for a reopening that would leave kids out of the classroom as much as, five, as three days a week. Yesterday, one critic of the government slammed that plan, saying, I want kids in school five days a week. We don't need to shut schools down on a Wednesday to clean. That critic, Mr. Speaker, was the Premier himself. So, to the Minister of Education, if even the Premier doesn't understand your plan, how do you expect parents and teachers to? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we understand the incredible challenges that COVID-19 has imposed on working parents, on educators, and of course, the mental health of our kids. It's why, Speaker, we have brought forth a plan to request school boards to be prepared for all three circumstances that are manifesting globally around us in the context of the reopening of schools. It's why we put in place a training regime that will ensure all staff, including educators, are better prepared to respond to these very unique and real challenges that will uh, take place. And more importantly, it's why we put in place additional funding. But, Speaker, beyond that, it is a commitment we're making to the people of this province to do whatever it takes to keep kids safe. And we want to ensure we maintain the integrity of learning each and every day, but it has to be safe. And that's why we're working so closely with the Chief Medical Officer to achieve that objective, Speaker. And a supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the Minister of Education and the Premier aren't just on different pages, they're on different planets. Yesterday, the Premier said he wants staff cleaning schools overnight instead of shutting down for a day. But unfortunately for parents, the Minister fired hundreds of custodial workers and school support staff just last year. The Premier can't keep telling parents they're getting help while doing nothing to help them. When will the Premier, or when will they actually, get a concrete plan together uh, that not only gets kids back to school full-time in the fall, but gives school boards, staff, uh, and, and uh, all concerned, the financial support that they need to keep everyone safe? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Indeed, it is the priority of the government to keep kids safe because we recognize that for so many people in the province, particularly parents, this has been uniquely challenging for them. And that's why we want to ensure that their kids are in class each and every day. But before we can make that commitment, before any legislator could submit to themselves that that is the plan for it, it has to be safe. It has to be based on public health data. It has to be based on some metric that gives people public confidence to do that. And I just believe it is irresponsible to not want to adhere to the advice of the chief medical officer in order to build out that scenario. So what we've asked of boards is for three circumstances, three plans to respond to potential scenarios that may arise over the next 30, 60 days in the context of the Ontario's response, an incredible response rather, to COVID-19. Our commitment is to ensure funding and training remains in place. We'll lick, work closely and, uh, with our school board to ensure we get this right, because when it comes to our kids, we'll do whatever it takes to keep Once. them safe. Yeah. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, parents need a plan to hire teachers and education workers, make desperately needed repairs, and install touch-free sinks and soap dispensers so kids will be safe from infection. Instead, they have a premier who talks about opening schools three days a week, while quietly or five days a week rather, while quietly ordering Order. school boards to do the exact opposite. The for Ford government needs to put their money where their. I'm sorry to interrupt the leader of the opposition. The Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries cannot yell back to a colleague two rows back during question period. That's We're going to add some time to the clock. Okay, the, the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries will come to order. Again, I'll recognize the Leader of the Opposition and I'll give you some additional time. I'm sorry I didn't stop the clock. Thank you. Kindly, Speaker. Uh, instead, what they have is a Premier who talks about opening schools five days a week while quietly ordering them to do the opposite. The Ford government needs to put their money where the Premier's mouth is, Speaker. The Toronto District School Board came forward today with a plan to hire additional teachers to ensure that kids can safely return to school five days a week. Will the Premier support that? 
Minister of Education to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our commitment is to keep kids safe. That is why, Speaker, we've asked school boards of the province to be prepared for three circumstances so that we can respond to the reality on the ground in 30, 60, 90 days as it arises in the province. We have an obligation, and the Premier has been very clear when it comes to my mandate, to build out plans to keep kids safe, to ensure the continuity of learning is not impeded as a result of a challenge that could arise. In jurisdictions that have reopened schools, Speaker, we have seen difficulty, and the commitment we are making to the Leader of the Opposition, to all parliamentarians, is to work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, with our school boards, with our Federation partners, to ensure everyone is safe with the resources and training in place, because as we have said, we will do whatever it takes to keep our youngest learners safe in the province of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. My next question is to the Premier. Yesterday, Ontario hospitals called on the government pr to produce a contingency plan to ensure that health care, the South care system is equipped for potential second surge of COVID-19 outbreaks. In response, uh, the Premier insisted that the province was completely prepared. The government used that exact same word months ago when they insisted that cuts to public health wouldn't impact COVID response and when they insisted that there was an iron ring around long-term care homes and they were completely prepared to contain the spread of COVID, which instead claimed thousands of lives in our province. Will the government make details of their plans public today? Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Well, thank you. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, assure the Leader of the Official Opposition that there is a detailed contingency plan in place for a second wave, and we also know that we have flu season approaching as well. One of the issues we're dealing with many issues. One is the fact that there are many people who are now alternate level of care that are back in hospital because some of the long-term care homes that had four bedrooms now are reducing those to two people per room for isolation and protection against COVID-19. So we're dealing with that and we're watching the capacity in the hospitals as we're also trying to deal with catching up on the delayed procedures and surgeries that had to be delayed in order to create the capacity in the hospitals in the first place. And case, we were faced with major outbreaks of COVID-19. Fortunately, that did not happen in the first wave. We weren't having to deal with situations such as happened in Italy and Spain and even in New York. Response? But we are prepared for a second wave. I'm very pleased to discuss that in the supplemental. Well, Speaker, the assurances that this government gave last time did not save lives and did not spread, stop the spread of COVID-19, particularly in long-term care. Hospitals have particularly flagged human resource challenges in the next wave, and we're hearing directly from frontline health care heroes that they're exhausted, that they're run off their feet, and they're seriously concerned about the Premier's plan to indefinitely suspend their rights on the job with Bill 195. Months ago, the government wrongly insisted that they had a plan for the human resource challenges of COVID-19, and instead they left PSW speaker working at multiple sites for months, leading to the spread of COVID-19 and, in several cases, in many cases, uh, their deaths. Will the government make their plans for dealing with the human resource challenges of the second wave public today? The health Minister. Well, uh, I, we are certainly concerned with the health human resources, particularly since there have been a number of people who have not been able to come back to work or did not come back to work in long-term care homes with making sure that they have adequate resources. But we also have made sure that they have had the resources in the shorter term by allowing people from hospitals to go in and help in long-term care homes. In fact, right now we are currently running 11 long-term care homes through hospital personnel. We're also in another 11 long-term care homes providing assistance. We know that staff, when they come back to hospital, are going to need some respite because they, they've been taken from their original circumstances. They're working under difficult circumstances in long-term care. We know they need a respite. We know they can't keep going five, six months without a break because they're dealing with people dying. They're dealing with very ill people. They're dealing with stressful circumstances. That is something Response. we are certainly taking into consideration as we are ramping up for a busier flu season, a potential second wave, and catching up on those surgeries and procedures. But the uh, frontline workers, who are the heroes in all of this, are very much on our minds, and we want to make sure that they are not completely depleted, both physically and mentally. We want to make sure that they can stay on the, on the job and stay strong. And the final supplementary. 
Back to the Premier Speaker. The government's claim that Ontario is prepared for every contingency of the second wave would sound more believable if it wasn't exactly what the government had been insisting at the start of the first first wave. But whether it's residents in long-term care homes left without staff to care for them or parents left without a plan for child care or schools, the Premier's boastful claims have failed to match reality far too many times. When will the government be releasing details so that the public knows what's going to happen, details of their plans to handle the second wave across our entire health care system? Minister of health. Well, I thank you for the question, but we have been releasing information publicly virtually every single day. The Premier has been releasing this information. I've been releasing information from the Ministry of Health, and our plan is working. And I just want to just give you a few statistics for anyone that has any doubt about that. Ontario, with 14,711,000 people, has had 36,950 cases, the number of cases per 100,000, 251 versus, let's say, Quebec, population of 8.5 million, 56,730 cases, 664 cases per 100,000. And it, take another take a state. Let's look at uh, Florida, 21 million people, 291,000 cases of COVID-19, 1,347 Response. cases per 100,000. The statistics speak for themselves. Our plan is working for the first wave, and should we encounter a second wave, we will be prepared for that as well. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier, but I have to remind the Minister that we've seen over 1,830 seniors die in long-term care, and the OHA is sounding the alarm bells about our preparedness. So I, I would take that in, into consideration if I were her. Yesterday, the Mayor of Toronto repeated warnings that the city is going to face massive tax increases or devastating cuts to services if the provincial and federal governments don't come through with operational emergency operational funding. Uh, he said, quote, Toronto doesn't have the luxury of time, and the longer the city waits for funding, the deeper the cuts will be. The Premier claimed to agree with the Mayor yesterday, but then passed the buck to Ottawa and said it was up to the federal government to come up with a solution. Does the Premier of Ontario, of this province, have a plan for municipalities in Ontario beyond passing the buck to Ottawa? <laughs> Premier to reply. Well, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for, for the comments. Uh, we've been on the phone every single day getting a great plan not only for Ontario, but every single province and territories across this uh, great country, Mr. Speaker, and we're very, very close, but uh, I'm just not going to walk away and leave uh, billions of dollars on the table. I've been in constant communication every single day with Mayor Tory along with uh, other mayors, and uh, I agree with what Mayor Tory said the other day, Mr. Speaker. We need a national strategic plan the member for Waterloo will come to order. municipalities. And that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for the 444 municipalities every single day. And yes, we do need support from the federal government. Yeah. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, yesterday I met with the Mayor of Mississauga, and later today the Finance Committee will be hearing from representatives from the Association of Municipalities of Ontario about the impacts of COVID-19. The message has been consistent, Speaker, and the message has been clear. Municipalities cannot bear these costs alone. They need operational funding from the provincial and federal governments, or else municipal services will be put at long-term risk. And I just want to repeat, it's not just the federal government's responsibility, it is the provincial government's responsibility as well to open the coffers and help municipalities out. So my question is, regardless, regardless of what the federal government chooses to do, will the Premier right now promise Ontarians that municipalities will not be forced to bear the costs and risk of COVID-19 and that this Premier will step up to the plate and help our municipalities as he should. Order. Through, through you to reply. Through you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I don't know if the Leader of the Opposition isn't paying attention, but we've already funded over $400 million to the municipalities, and there's, and there's actually more, more coming. But again, uh, I, I would rather have no deal than a bad deal. 
And right now, we're very close. We're in full communication with the federal government, and I, I personally think they're doing a, a really good job. They're doing their best to, to help all the provinces out, and uh, we're having great conversations. And hopefully, very soon, we'll have a deal. But uh, again, Mr. Speaker, we're going to have a deal that represents all 444 municipalities, not just one or two municipalities, but all 444 of them. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier, but before I get started, I just wanted to thank him uh, for coming down to Waterloo Region yesterday and, and spending here, here. some time down there and getting to, to meet with some of our local businesses. Premier, our priority as a government has always been clear. We will do everything to ensure the health and safety of people of this province while doing all we can to restart our economy as quickly as it is safe to do so. For our initial response to COVID-19 declaring a state of emergency, to our Ontario Action Plan for supporting businesses and the health sector, to our stage framework for reopening, our province continues to make great strides. We're in this position because all Ontarians made the choice to act responsibly and treat each other with respect. Whether it's wearing a mask when we can't physically distance, working from home when possible, or adjusting our business to adhere to public health advice, can the Premier please share with this legislature about the next phase of reopening for various regions of our province? Premier. Well, I, I want to I wanna thank the, the member from Kitchener-Conestoga along with the other uh, members from Waterloo Region. We had an incredible uh, visit there yesterday and, and went into uh, Challenger. Uh, these are the folks who are responsible for uh, you know, bringing goods from point A to point B. Went to an incredible company, Mr. Speaker, called Eclipse. And they're making a million N95 masks every single week. This is a company that uh, focuses on automation. And then we went to Shaver. Shaver switched over their manufacturing to make face shields. And I'm just so proud of all those companies out there. Went out there to, to thank them and, and get the, the province moving forward. In June, Ontario created over 378,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, including 66,000 new jobs in the, in the manufacturing sector. And that's what I was seeing yesterday when I was traveling the province up to the Waterloo Spons? region. We're bringing manufacturing back to Ontario once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. Uh, Premier, that is very exciting news for uh, my constituents and the people of Waterloo Region. With many parts of the province moving into Stage 3, this will include expanding the limits on public gatherings. With new limits, uh, allowing up to 100 people to gather outdoors and up to 50 people indoors. It is through our collective efforts that Ontario is in a strong position amidst the global pandemic that is continuing to take a human toll in our province and unfortunately to a much greater degree in some other places beyond our borders. As the Premier has said on numerous occasions, no business should reopen until they feel it is safe to do so. Speaker, can the Premier inform the Legislature about what operations will be allowed to resume as part of Stage 3 and what health and safety measure measures should be put in place? Premier. Again, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank the, the member from Kitchener-Conestoga. Stage 3 reopening will give our province a, another economic boost. Nearly all businesses and public spaces will be allowed to open their doors safely. That is why we are glad to announce the following businesses and places will be allowed to open in Stage 3. One, dine-in restaurants and certain bar operations, gyms and fitness centers, most personal care services, live shows, performing arts and movie theaters, recreational facilities and activities, and a tour, uh, tour guide uh, services. Mr. Speaker, I, I had a phone call yesterday, and I don't know how they get my cell number, but the gentleman called me that has 2,000 2, employees. I know, I'm, I'm one of the few that actually talk to the real people out there, and that's why I'm traveling around. Order. Mr. Speaker, you know something? I got a call from, from a gym owner that has 17. Uh... Holding him. Member for Timmins will come to order. Premier, conclude your answer, please. I have an opportunity. A gentleman that called me, uh, messaged me yesterday. He has 17 gyms around the province. He has 2,000 employees, a payroll of $46.6 million. And he is telling me the story. Uh, that is 2,000 employees can't get back to work now because Response. of what we've done, they can get back to work, making sure they can put food on the table, pay their mortgages. That's what we're doing right across the province, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and this question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, all of us, I'm sure, uh, in this room have been inundated with emails from desperate parents all over Ontario worried that the government isn't doing their job to prepare for the safe reopening of schools. 
Jennifer, a parent of three in the Ottawa region, said she is concerned about the effects that part-time school combined with online learning will have on our children's mental health. Jill, a mom of two, wants to know what parents are supposed to do on the days their children are not in school, send them to a pub. Stuart, from my riding, wrote, with this hybrid model, working parents, but working mothers and many frontline and essential workers in particular, are being asked to do the impossible, choose between their children and their livelihood. Mr. Speaker, many of these letters are copied to the Premier. Why isn't he listening? Minister of Education, reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, you know, I appreciate that many moms and dads in the province of Ontario have faced great challenges, economic, uh, as well as the mental health and safety of their own children and, of course, themselves. And it is the obligation of the government, working closely with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, to build out a protocol that keeps every child and staff member safe in Ontario. And the government's preference, I will reaffirm, is to get kids into class on a daily conventional model, day-to-day um, -day with heightened safety protocols. But, Speaker, our commitment first and foremost, before today, committing to that, absent that data, is to make sure that we are prepared for every circumstance that may arise in September, because in the absence of knowing with absolute clarity the risk associated in 30 and 60 and 90 days, we're going to be prepared. That is the prudent way forward. It's why most provinces in this federation are proceeding on that basis. The commitment remains to keep kids safe. That's exactly what we're going to do, Speaker. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, you know, Ontarians did the right thing. They stayed home, and their actions have bought us precious time. But the Premier and this government are wasting that time now. They are leaving parents in the dark about their children's education while they're watching daily announcements about the opening of golf clubs and bars and casinos. We have just six weeks to go. Six Order. weeks to go. The clock Order. is ticking. And there is a way forward. I'd ask the members opposite, From please. Side, come to order. I have tabled a motion. I have tabled a motion that calls on the government to hire Clark. No. <laughs> the member for Mississauga East Cooksville will come to order. The member for Northumberland Peterborough South will come to order. There are a number of members over here that were yelling as well. I could call you out by name too. Next time I will. It's a state of emergency in the province of Ontario. That's why we're here in July. Restart the clock. Member for Davenport. I was going to say, and I, I hope they're listening now, that I have tabled a motion that calls on the government to hire more teachers for smaller classes, more custodians to do the cleaning and maintenance that are essential for infection control, and investments in upgrades to make buildings safer. Will the Premier finally get the message from parents across this province, pass our motion today, and do what's needed to ensure a safe return to school for all our students this September? Uh, Mr. Speaker, we believe, uh, progressive Conservatives believe, that it's not an either-or proposition. We can have a growing economy while concurrently having quality education in the province of Ontario. I respectfully reject the premise by the member opposite. Speaker, our plan is, yes, to grow the economy, create jobs, put people back to work, instill a sense of confidence in the market, but, Speaker, Order. it's early about ensuring that students remain learning under any scenario that may manifest. The, the Leader of the Opposition just asked a question earlier about the inevitability of a second wave. We must be prepared. Of course, Speaker, it is no one in this side of the House that wants, a, wants an online option in lieu of in-class conventional learning. But, Speaker, is that not a lesson learned for all of us as legislators, that we have an obligation to ensure that kids remain learning irrespective of the challenge that arises? We're going to work very closely with the Chief Medical Officer, put the resources, the training in place to keep every Response. child safe in Ontario. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Speaker, while the Premier is playing his version of Where's Waldo this summer, parents and kids across Ontario they're going to be searching. Order. They're going to be searching. They're going to be searching, not for the premier. They're searching for a plan for full-time school resuming in the fall. And speaker, you know what? They're not going to find one. There's no plan for more educators. No plan for more spaces to learn. No plan for more supports for vulnerable students. There is. Not, it's not there, and not only families need a plan, but our economy needs a plan so that people can fully participate in the workforce. Speaker, when is the Premier going to put forward a plan so we can have our kids return to school full-time this fall in classes that are smaller and safer? Thank you. 
Oh. To reply? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the only thing the member opposite is searching for is a purpose in this legislature after a decade of inaction, of higher taxes, of school closures. I mean, Speaker, the people of this province gave us a mandate to ensure that we prudently prepare for all circumstances, that we have a plan to improve quality education, to ensure that every single student gets a, an experience that is defensible in every region of the province, irrespective if you live in an urban or rural setting, north, south, east, and west. Our plan, Speaker, is to put more funding in place more training in place, and a clear commitment in consultation with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to keep kids and staff safe. And we will do that over the coming weeks, building out these plans, working with our boards to get this right and keep everyone safe in this province. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And it was a real debate between Where's Waldo and Dora the Explorer. So in my hometown of Ottawa, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vera Etches, has said, I am recommending we prioritize and plan to have students in class five days a week, and we work from there to make sure we make that as safe as possible. Ottawa school boards agree with Dr. Etches. Here's the kicker. Here's the thing. Speaker, they're not going to be able to do that unless the Premier gives them the resorts, the resources and the investments that they need to keep class sizes smaller and safer. So far, Mr. Speaker, the Premier has not stepped up with a plan to do that. So, Speaker, through you, is the Premier prepared to do what's right for our kids, for our families, for our economy, and invest in a plan Question. to get children back into school full-time this fall? And the Minister of Education. Thank you. Um, speaker, I uh, just want to affirm to the member opposite that the government uh, is working closely with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to ensure kids remain safe. And we have announced to date, through the grant for student needs, this, the large vehicle of funding to school boards and a net investment in every school board, in every region, every town in this province, funding is up in this respect. But we recognize, Speaker, that there's more to do. And that's why we're working closely with school boards, federation partners, and of course, the Chief Medical Officer of Health to ensure that we have the resources in place, the staffing in place to keep these kids safe. But when it comes to our priority, is to build out three scenarios to respond to three very real circumstances that may arise. That's prudent. It's about keeping kids safe, but also ensuring that kids continue to learn, irrespective of the challenges on the horizon. Speaker. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And today, my question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. And before I ask my question, I just want to thank the minister for her advocacy to get Toronto moving for transit uh, and for the people of Etobicoke. And I just want to say thank you for your hard work on that. But highways also play a very crucial role in moving goods, and this has clearly been evident throughout this pandemic. We rely on our highways to get food, medicine, and other critical supplies to the people all around our province. However, COVID-19 has had an effect on every part of our economy, including the construction industry. Speaker, can the minister tell us what this government has been doing to ensure that the current highway projects that were under construction prior to the pandemic are being built as quickly as possible? Thank you. The Associate Minister for Transportation, TTA. Thank you. And I want to thank the member from, uh, from Etobicoke Lakeshore for working so diligently and so hard during COVID-19. It's certainly a wonderful neighbour to have. I I wholeheartedly agree with the member on the importance that our provincial highway network has played in getting crucial goods into the hands of Ontarians during the pandemic. With COVID-19 impacting traffic levels, we took an opportunity to see where we could accelerate work on 51 different highway and bridge projects, including parts of Highway 401 and 400, to make sure we can avoid delays as much as possible. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic has reminded all of us in the, in the House how important our highway network is in the province of Ontario and how we have to continue to invest in it. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, thank you very much for that response. And I'm very glad to see that our government is taking steps to make sure that the ripple effects of COVID-19 do not leave needless delays on these critical infrastructure projects. And I agree that it's so important that we keep these crucial projects on track. Speaker, last week the government announced a plan to build highways faster by removing red tape and regulations while investing $2.6 billion to expand and repair Ontario's highways and bridges. 
Can the minister please tell the House more about this multi-billion dollar plan to expand Ontario's highways network while doing it more efficiently? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Transportation. Well, it's certainly good to be expediting work on projects that are already underway. We need to get shovels in the ground faster for new projects. That's why Bill 197, if passed, would also streamline highway projects so that we can get to work faster on important projects such as uh, widening Highway 3, Highway 17, and Highway 69. The existing process can add months of red tape and construction delays up to 12 months for highway projects. We believe that landowners have a right to be heard that will never change, and that is why we are developing a responsible and timely alternative process. Mr. Speaker, we're making transportation a priority and working to get critical infrastructure built in the province of Ontario. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, for the past two days, uh, this government has refused to answer our questions or those of the media about contracting out COVID-19 testing to a private startup healthcare company that has no footprint or experience providing these services in Ontario up until about a month ago. The government already had the power to move public health staff, including nurses and aides, to where they were needed most. Speaker, that was the whole point of their emergency orders. Now the government is saying that this contract was granted in a competitive process. Will the government make the contract and tendering process public today so that people can see for themselves? Reply. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, we have dealt with this question twice already, but, Speaker, I want to be perfectly clear. Ontario Health, an independent organization, was responsible for acquiring the contract with Switch Health. With the increased need Order. for on site testing on farms in Windsor, Essex, it was clear that swift action needed to be taken, and it was. Ontario Health sought requests for proposals for mobile testing from 15 different vendors. Through this competitive process and in following usual procurement processes and timelines, Ontario Health evaluated and assessed these proposals using standard criteria. Switch Health proved to have the means to get the job done and diligently and effectively, which is why they were granted Response. the contract. And again, Speaker, I want to be very clear that this contract was awarded through normal channels and was led by Ontario Health. The supplementary question. Uh, then make the contract public. Let us let us see. Uh, Speaker, the minister would know that the, the chief coroner's office had offered early on to mobilize mobile testing units down to our, our region. That was never taken up, nor was it uh, commanded by the Minister of Health or Ontario Health. Why not? We could have used those resources sooner. But, Speaker, let's be clear about what the Premier and the Health Minister think of their own public service and what they cannot do, especially when a friendly lobbyist shows up ready to get a contract. Ontario Health has refused to provide any details on how this contract was awarded. The company itself is sending all questions back to Ontario Health. The only thing we know is that this company hired the creator of the Premier's Vanity YouTube channel. Within weeks, they had a contract to provide testing, and so, so far, only a fraction of workers on farm have been tested. Question. Will the Premier do the right thing today and release the contracts and details of the tendering process? Again, Minister Bell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to assure the people of Ontario, through you, Mr. Speaker, that they, the on-site testing has been done uh, from day one, that it has Order. been done in conjunction with the local public health units, with Ontario Public Health, with Dr. Heyer, who has been helping Order. out with these contracts, with these making sure that the right people are sent there. We've employed mobile testing units. We have assessment centers there. We did have one in Leamington. We're trying to uh, we're Member for Essex will come to order. Coming to them, but they are coming now. We have turned things around. People are submitting for testing, but there was a need for more testing to be done, and that's why Ontario Health sought proposals from 15 different vendors and evaluated each and every proposal according to the normal. The member for Essex will come to order. You had a chance to ask your questions. You had two questions. Give her a chance to reply without interruption. I apologize to the Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Speaker. The normal procurement processes were used here. The contracts were evaluated using the standard criteria, and Switch Health was found to be the one by Ontario Health to be able to quickly and effectively move in to continue with the testing. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Everybody in this House knows that parents are stressed about their children's mental health and their learning success if schools don't open full-time in the fall. But the Premier also needs to know that businesses are stressed, too. I talk to business owner after business owner who say we cannot reopen the economy if our children don't have a place to go in the fall. They're worried about a mass exodus of women from the workplace. The elephant in the room, Speaker, is money. Is the government going to invest the money for our children to be able to go back to school safely, to hire more staff, to have more space, to invest in safe cleaning protocols? These are investments in our children's future. Speaker, the Premier said he would spare no expense in dealing with this pandemic. Will he spare no expense to invest in our children's future so they can go back to school? The Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for the question for his letter to me yesterday on this matter. Uh, Speaker, the Premier has been clear. We will do whatever it takes to keep students in this province safe. And it's why, Speaker, we've already put in place additional funding for all school boards. It's why we've asked for and announced additional professional development and training of all staff and educators in the province. But, Speaker, I recognize that these challenges are unique and the obligation of the government is to do whatever it takes to achieve that objective. We will work closely with the Chief Medical Officer, with school boards, with our Federation partners, with everyone involved, with moms and dads across the province, to achieve one aim. It's the continuity of learning that is safe for every child in Ontario. Supplementary question. I appreciate the minister's response, but the bottom line is, and every parent, student, and teacher in this province knows that the money the government's put on the table is completely insufficient to be able to safely reopen schools. So I'm going to try to put this in a way the Premier can understand. Businesses go in debt to make investments for their long-term business success because they know there's a huge return in, on investment. Investing in our children is exactly the same thing. Now is the time not to, not to avoid debt, but to actually invest in our children's future because the return on investment is priceless. And so I'm asking you, through you, Speaker, to the Minister of Education, will the Premier spare no expense in our children's future? so they can go back to school full-time in the fall safely. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, as the Premier has noted numerous times and members of this team, is we will do whatever it takes to ensure kids remain safe in schools. That is our priority and is what we will achieve. And with respect, in the context of funding, we have announced so far $730 million additional investment, and certainly net new investment in school boards. Every board in Ontario has that investment. But beyond the funding and beyond the training, Speaker, we recognize these determinations must be made based on public health advice to ensure that we can respond to the challenges province-wide in 30, 60, and 90 days. To do that, we have three plans in place. And the focus over the coming days will be to work closely with our health experts, with the command table and Dr. Williams, to create a protocol that keeps all students safe, supported by enhanced investments, enhanced training, so that every student and every staff in Ontario is safe in September, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Over the last four weeks, we saw over 240 Ontario businesses testify at the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Included in these testimonies were representatives from the performing arts and entertainment industries who outlined the important social and economic value these industries provide Ontario. We heard from leaders from the Shaw Festival, TIFF, and Pride Toronto, and many other leaders from the industry. Mr. Speaker, their message was clear. The economic and cultural significance of live theater and entertainment is critical for tourism and our 
and economic necessity for Ontario at large. Minister, given certain parts Question. of the province entering phase three, what will the new normal look like for the performing arts and entertainment industries? Thank you. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industry. Thank you very much uh, to the member uh, from Mississauga East Cooksville for his dedication. Uh, with the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs, who found out that the $75 billion economic uh, generator, which is the heritage, sport, tourism, and culture industries, took about a $20 billion hit in the last uh, number of weeks. Uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity with the Minister of Education to uh, visit the McMichael Gallery, uh, the most exquisite collection of Canadian art in the entire country. We invested $3.3 million. They will be reopening on July the 31st. Today, I'm going to be traveling to Hamilton to go to the, auto, the, the um, Art Gallery of Hamilton to support them with an additional investment speaker. These sectors have been crushed. And that's why it's disappointing to hear slurs being like Dora the Explorer or Where's Waldo. The reality is every member of this assembly, including the leader of the opposition, including the leader of the Liberal Party in the House, should be doing what the Premier and members of this cabinet and this government are doing, which is traveling the province safely as we are allowed to do, thanks to the great advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the great work done by the Ministry of Labour. We must support these sectors. It is dire. Question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the minister perfectly detailed the importance of the performing arts and entertainment industries, while also underlining the importance of reintroducing consumer confidence when entering phase three. Minister, our performing arts and entertainment industries generate a lot of money for the people of Ontario. The scale of these industries' success demonstrates Ontario's pride of place. In fact, in Ontario, the culture industry alone generates over $25 billion and supports over 285,000 jobs. The Toronto International Film Festival generates more than $200 million in annual economic activity to Ontario's tourism and hospitality sector alone, reaches over 851.7 million people globally and has attracted more than 1.2 million visitors in the last three years. It is no great leap to understand how many important these industries are for Ontario. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as such, what kind of supports are we providing to these industries to overcome COVID-19? Minister of Heritage, reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. A great question because I think it's important. As we dealt with the public health crisis and the economic crisis, we are dealing with the social crisis, trying to get people to go back into our communities, to reconnect with Ontarians, and to love what makes us love our province most, which is the cultural fabric of sports, of culture, of entertainment. The things that we're most proud of have been um, under attack, uh, just as the health care system has been over the past four months, and it will take a long time to recover, which is why our ministry has invested over $300 million in direct supports for our cultural uh, attractions and, uh, and entities across the province, over $200 million, for example, to the Ontario Arts Council, Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund, and the Ontario Trillium Foundation, who I met with earlier today. I also met with MLSC today um, to talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs being a hub city. And Speaker, did you know? that because of that, we are investing a lot into the entertainment world in the city of Toronto by selling out two hotels. That Response. might not be the big economic activity we had when we became the NBA world champions, but Speaker, we are slowly getting there, and that's why this legislature needs to show confidence in my sectors. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. CTV reported that it estimated that about 124 Royal Canadian Legion branches are likely to close permanently, and another 357 are facing financial hardship. Two months ago, Legions in Ontario sent the Premier a letter explaining that the pandemic has created financial risk and that some of our Legions will be shut down permanently. Last week, you responded, and yet it appears that you did not understand what veterans and legions were requesting. Legions are requesting support for operational cost. You ignored that. Instead, you pointed them to the senior community grant. Mr. Speaker, they didn't ask for a program support, and further to that, memberships, memberships to legions is not limited just to seniors. What about modern-day veterans like my son? Peacekeeper sport operations, Korean War operations, and others. 
Does this government think that there Question. are two classes of veterans in Canada? Will this grant government commit to doing something to help all veterans and all legions today in Ontario with their request to operational support? Minister of Heritage to reply. Great question. I want to thank the member opposite for her sacrifice and her son's sacrifice. We've had that conversation before. Uh, he's a true Canadian hero, uh, and I, I respect it. And I believe every member of this assembly wants to say thank you to him. Uh, legions are very important to me. I'm a member of the Barhaven Legion. Um, it's one of the youngest legions in the country, um, but it is one of the fastest growing. And uh, again, I guess if uh, 45 makes me a senior, then uh, that, that's a bit of a problem. But maybe uh, my time here at Queen's Park has aged me a bit. But uh, I want to tell you this is a very important issue that I've raised already with my federal counterpart, Stephen Gabot, who is the Minister of Heritage. We are going to be working, uh, I believe, with the Minister of Veterans Affairs Canada to see how we can best come up with a solution. I have to say, as somebody who has spent a great deal of my time supporting our veterans, uh, my husband being one of them and has uh, went non-combat to Afghanistan, it's very important to me that we recognize their contributions and the contributions of their family. Uh, I often refer to this place as a place where we were allowed to debate simply because of the sacrifices generations ago. Go made for response. This so uh, I will work with the member opposite. I will take her concerns and I will happily advocate at a national level so that we uh, we are not just alone in that uh, in that fight. Thank you. Supplementary question: The member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Legions in Scarborough Southwest and across the province offer so much to our veterans and our seniors. They deliver key services to our community, provide affordable space to rent and a safe space to gather, and organize remembrance activities and services. From birthday parties to weddings, cultural events, artisan shops, bazaars also take place in our legions. As with other organizations, our legions hall, legion halls are struggling because of COVID-19. Unfortunately, legions in my riding and across the province are being left without help from governments. The Dominion president wrote to the prime minister, highlighting, and I quote, legion branches which are, which are literally helping to save lives and improve communities are struggling with the fear of closure, with no government help in sight. Mr. Speaker, we have a responsibility. Our legion halls have been a local hub and an essential part of our communities. Will this government commit today to helping all veterans and legions with their request for operational support? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Minister of Heritage to reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And again, what a great question, and I think a, a very timely and important one. Um, this ministry and this government is absolutely committed to our veterans. We are com committed as well to those who can currently serve in any capacity on the front lines, uh, particularly in our military. Uh, that is why our government has maintained a commitment to uh, build the, the Afghanistan War Memorial on the front lawn of this esteemed assembly. And uh, that is why we were proud as a government. Um, to support a 1-800 uh, uh, hotline for veterans. I personally, as a member of the opposition, stood here in support of the McGuinty government when they designated a portion of the 401, the Highway of Heroes. Speaker, we have a long tradition in this province of supporting our military, and we will continue to have a strong, uh, we will continue to have a strong relationship with our local legion branches across the province of Ontario, which is why we're committed to working with members opposite, but most importantly with our federal counterparts to see how we can best sustain our local legion. Speaker, in many cases, the local legion particularly having grown up in rural, uh, rural Nova Scotia. Response. That local legion is actually the community centre for a number of people. It is a gathering place that needs to be protected, and we will look within the ministry for all streams that may be able to support the member's request. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Energy. This week, our government announced that many regions of the province will be moving into stage three of the recovery plan. Speaker, while many Ontarians remain optimistic about recovery efforts, the pandemic has caused some Ontarians to fall behind on their bills. Could the Associate Minister please tell us how our government is supporting Ontarians struggling to catch up on their energy bills as we recover from COVID-19? Thank you. The Associate Minister for Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Member for Whitby for the question and for the great job he does for those people in Whitby and also as our Chief Government Whip. Here, 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 here. Mr. Speaker, our government continues to provide support for residential, farm and small business electricity consumers during the COVID-19 outbreak. On Monday, applications opened for the COVID-19 Energy Assistance Program, or SEEP. 
for residential consumers. Through the SEAT program, our government is providing $9 million to help struggling families with a one-time payment to help clear potentially overdue electricity bill debt incurred over the COVID-19 outbreak period. Ontarians can contact, can contact their local utility to apply. Similarly, more information will be coming later this summer regarding the Seat for Small Business program. Through this program, our government will be providing $8 million to support small businesses struggling with bill payments as a result of COVID-19. This is in addition to the extension of the Ontario Energy Board's winter disconnection ban until July 31, 2020, which has ensured that no one is disconnected from their natural Response. gas or electricity service during these uncertain times. Mr. Speaker, our government is supporting all Ontarians as we continue to recover from COVID-19. Well said. question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. Speaker, for the past four months, Ontarians have been making sacrifices and working hard to fight the outbreak of COVID-19. We know that those sacrifices, including spending more time at home, can result in increased use of electricity. Can the Associate Minister please update this House on the measures that our government has taken to support Ontarians when it comes to their electricity bills throughout this pandemic? The Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you, Speaker. And again, to the Honourable Member for uh, Whitby, thank you for a great question. Our government thanks the people of Ontario for following the best advice of health professionals and practicing social distancing. We recognize that staying home means using more electricity during the day. That's why we invested $175 million to hold time of use electricity rates at the lowest price, known as off peak rate 24 hours a day for the first 69 days of the COVID-19 state of emergency. On June 1st, we suspended the time of use rates and introduced a new fixed COVID-19 recovery rate to be in effect 24 hours a day, seven days a week until October 31st, 2020. And on November 1st, our government will be giving in terms the ability to choose an energy program that works best for their lifestyle either time of use or tiered rates. Mr. Speaker, we know that COVID-19 has changed many aspects of life every day for Ontarians, including how and when they use electricity. Response. We've taken important measures to help Ontarians through this pandemic and provide choice and flexibility, and we'll continue to make them our priority. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Timmins. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Premier. About three weeks ago, you were asked to comment on the huge price differential Northerners are having to pay for gas compared to what we pay in Southern Ontario. Your response was, it's totally unfair. Agreed. Are gas companies just trying to gouge people? I think so. After further questioning by the media, you went on to say that the province is well aware of the situation. And let me quote what you said. Our Minister of Energy is all over this. We're all going to get to an explanation from the gas companies for this because it's absolutely unacceptable. People are having to pay 20 to 30 percent more for gas in Northern Ontario. My question is simply this. Premier, has your government asked for that explanation from the gas companies yet? And if so, will you table it here in the House? Before I invite a response, I'm going to remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for the question because, as he, as he knows, we uh, we take uh, uh, this uh, very seriously. We've seen across uh, across Canada the impact that COVID-19 has had on uh, on our on our workers in the in the oil sector, but more importantly, on uh, on Northern Ontario. I know the Minister of Energy uh, uh, did ask the Competition Bureau for uh, some clarification on this. He's been very clear uh, in uh, in stating how upset he has been at the price differential. Uh, 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 Mr. Speaker, and just because we've had a pandemic, just because we've seen that the prices have come down across the province, doesn't mean that this government uh, uh, has has let uh, let go of that. But at the same token, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the honourable member will will join us in in, in reaching out uh, and thanking those uh, uh, those very important people who work in the energy sector and have done so much to help uh, keep uh, this economy growing, not only in the province of Ontario but uh, across Canada. Yeah, Supplementary question. Through you, uh, as a supplementary, the Premier didn't say that the Minister was going to go to the federal government to get an answer. He said he was going to contact the gas companies to find out why the price of gas has gone up. Since then, the price has gone up another 30 cents in Northern Ontario. Clearly, things aren't going in the right direction. So I'm going to ask you the question specifically again. Has your government asked the gas companies for an explanation as to why gas prices are increasing in Northern Ontario as compared to the South? And if so, will you table that answer? Government House Leader. 
Well, uh, again, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll, I'll, I'll help the, the member understand a little bit better. Of course, we reach out to, uh, to our partners uh, across various sectors, including uh, including the oil companies. Uh, but a very important step in that would be to reach out to the Competition Bureau of Canada. Having served federally, I understand that when these requests do come uh, uh, from uh, from our provincial partners or from other partners across uh, across the country, that it's taken very seriously. Of course, the member would can appreciate it's not just Northern Ontario; it's other parts of uh, of the country. Uh, which face the exact same challenges. Uh, uh, I am sure and I'm hopeful that uh, uh, the Competition Bureau will work with us to ensure that uh, not only the people in northern Ontario, but in other jurisdictions that are, uh, are rural in nature have, uh, have, a, have an answer. But at the same token, Mr. Speaker, I think it's also very important to recognize uh, the extraordinary good work that, uh, that our oil sector does uh, 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 and the jobs that it creates, not only in the province of Ontario, but across uh, across Canada and how important that sector has been uh, to creating jobs and economic growth for uh, for many decades mr. speaker thank you next question the member for Brantford brand thank you mr. speaker mr. speaker my question is for the minister of Envi the environment conservation and parks for decades under the previous government projects were shoved into the backyards of communities across Ontario that did not want them and unfortunately there was very little that municipalities could do to stop them. They were often not consulted on major projects like new landfill sites being proposed in their area, and there was often little that they could do to affect the outcome. That hardly seems fair for the municipalities that are working hard to represent the voices of their residents. I was pleased to see, however, that as part of Bill 197, the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act, a proposal to give more say to municipalities in landfill sightings. So can the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks share with the House more information about what this proposal will mean for municipalities across Ontario? Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Brantford Brant for that question and, and being such a reliable, strong, working, hard, uh, working member in this uh, legislature. And it's great to see him again after uh, the long due pandemic that uh, we've undergone. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the member from Oxford, uh, Mr. Speaker, who has championed this proposal for many, many years and has shown great leadership on this issue. And that's why we believe it's important that municipalities and communities affected by landfills are able to have appropriate say in the siting of landfills. We're committed to making this happen, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we're putting forward amendments to the Environmental Assessment Act that will require landfills of applicants to obtain support from their host municipality as part of the approval process. This is a balanced approach that gives municipalities greater say in the locations of landfills while providing certainty for landfill applicants for ensuring that there is local support before they submit a new application for a new landfill. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for listening to all of those communities across the province. It is clear that Ontarians have a government that is committed to putting them at the heart of all of our decision-making. Mr. Speaker, it's important for municipalities to be part of local decision-making and that they have a say in landfills approvals processes. It's also a key step in reducing local conflicts when operating landfills. The previous government did not seem to encourage consultation with municipalities, but I'm pleased to see that this municipal say in landfill proposal our government's commitment to work alongside our municipal partners to boost their participation in the planning and management of landfills. Can the minister share more on how this proposal will give municipalities more say in landfill approvals processes while providing certainty for landfill applicants? Thank you. Minister Environment. Thanks again for the follow-up question, Mr. Speaker. And over the past year, we have heard from over 140 municipalities who have asked to have a greater say in the siting of and approvals and landfills in their communities. Our government recognizes the importance of autonomy and local decision-making, and we believe landfills should be located in communities that are a willing host. Under our proposed amendment, applicants would be required to obtain support from the host municipality as well as the applicable neighbouring municipalities within 3.5 kilometres of proposed landfill property. This proposal uh, would also capture projects that are currently in the approvals process, more speci specifically projects that have an approved terms of reference, but have not yet obtained the environmental assessment decision. Mr. Speaker, we remain committed on this side of the House to working with landfill proponents, municipalities, First Nations and the public to make sure Response. the people of Ontario have the proper time to be necessarily uh, uh, consulted and that decisions are made 
not only in, in ensuring that landfills have the say, but that we are protecting the environment at the highest levels. Thank you very much. The next question, member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last year, Davin Hill Senior Living, a not-for-profit care home in my riding, was sold to developers, and the new owners started the process of forcing residents out of their homes. These families were given no compensation for relocating, and most were left on their own to try and figure out a new plan for their loved ones. Recently, I heard from Anne, whose mother, Doreen, used to live in Davin Hill but was evicted. Doreen has dementia and Alzheimer's, and since being forced out of her home, she suffered continued cognitive and physical decline. Speaker, families shouldn't have to go through something like this on their own. What is this government going to do to ensure seniors who have been evicted from seniors' homes like this can receive adequate compensation for relocating? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. Our government has been working hard to redevelop the long-term care sector, understanding that the capacity has not kept up with an aging population. And, and my heart goes out to everyone who has been waiting on the wait list who is affected by that lack of capacity. And that's why we are in, we've engaged with the sector over the past year to understand how to bring new projects on board, how to redevelop, how to ramp up that capacity, and whether that's in a physical structure or whether it's in innovative projects to help people manage longer at home and to support families through home care. Uh, these are all the measures that we need to take. And the reality is that 15 years have gone by and the proper measures were not put in place. Our government is taking this seriously in the way it needs to be taken, and we are ramping up capacity. You will see that as we move forward. You will see that in our announcements. You will see our commitment to long-term care and the seniors of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for today.